Welcome to the Babbling Pastor Podcast with your hosts, Michael and the Bearded Bible Thinker. Oh, uh, yeah, Rob. That's me. <laughs> there he is. Dude, if I haven't ever mentioned this before, but like, if you guys are listening to this podcast and you haven't listened to the Bearded Bible Thinker Podcast, Rob has his own podcast. Um, we're not going to go into the whole story, but I love the idea that like you got some <laughs> stuff for this podcast and you're like, I've already got this. I'm, I'm going to start my own <laughs> And then you, now your whole church, you have a whole podcast based out of your church too. So that's just really awesome. To yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, definitely been a work in progress. That's for sure. Yeah. Hey, it's, <laughs> it took forever. It, I'm still learning things. So <laughs> this, this go around, um, we had a lot of interest, uh, this in the last part of the last year we covered, um, and, uh, what was his name? Pagani and, uh, Alexander Pagani. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and Mike Squirty Nelly, or I don't know. How to... Okay, Signorelli. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And so we work through one of their videos talking about generational curses, and that was incredibly well received. A lot of people were very interested in that. They had a lot of questions about that. And then they were asking for some sort of more content down that sort of path. And at the same time, I was working on the Isaiah Saldivar video essay. So I have so much Isaiah Saldivar in my head <laughs> that I w there was a lot of things that kept coming up over and over again that Isaiah specifically was speaking about in regards to Christians and demon oppression or possession. And there's a handful of verses that kept coming up over and over again. And so Rob and I thought we would cover these today because uh, Isaiah, as well as Pagani and S Mike, whatever his last name is, which I still can't pronounce, all sort of hold to these basic verses, Isaiah specifically, that these verses prove um, that uh, Christians can be demonized or uh, oppressed. And so we're going to go through these. This is going to be the entire sort of month uh, content episodes here where we're going to work through each of these verses. There are a total of about about 10 that we're going to work through that at least Isaiah specifically says prove his point that uh, Christians can be um, demonized. So before we even get into it, because I do want to kind of get into the history of sort of demonology and stuff, but before we get into it, let's just state our points outright. Not that I think it's going to be a surprise, but Rob, where do you stand on this particular, um, this particular topic? Um, so I, yeah, I think that, um, I think first of all, they're, they're not, ever accused uh this i actually don't mean this to be uh an insult really but it's just a it's just a thing right like that that crowd uh that you just mentioned uh, isn't isn't really known for exegesis right uh like when they're preaching and that sort of thing i, I don't think that they're ignorant uh either um i mean he can just throw verses out all the time um uh however <clears throat> i think that um uh, there uh, certainly can be spirits in a person, uh, uh, whatever that means exactly or how that takes place. I don't think anybody can tell you, uh, at least not uh, concretely from the scriptures, exactly what that looks like. Uh, however, uh, once the Holy Spirit is the spirit that's in you, then greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, right? And uh, and I don't think at that point that you can be, uh, I, I know that they, they kind of go off about possessed. Yeah, well, we'd agree with that, right? Um, but uh, uh, they they have they have no power over you in 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 the ways that now that doesn't mean that you can't be used like the uh like the get behind me satan which we'll talk about right it doesn't mean that you can't inadvertently be utilized uh for the enemy's purposes uh which is one of the reasons we need you know uh, biblical knowledge and spiritual maturity and growth in our relationship with christ and all that but i guess that's kind of where i'm at i don't know no good deal so i it, what's really interesting about this topic is that like the good I, let me say this, I, hopefully in a way that's understandable to everyone. The good thing that the quote-unquote demon slayers have brought to the table is that they have brought up a topic that 
people typically don't speak about a lot. Like there, there is a yep. thing like demonology. It is, there is part of a theology in which, how do you deal with this? What is it? How do they work? All of this sort of stuff that really by and large, um, I mean, I know probably I can speak for both of us in our childhood was not even ever mentioned. <laughs> so it's one of the, and we know that demons can possess dogs. <laughs> so yes, that, oh my gosh, that is a story for another day. So I love telling that story, but so <laughs> I'm going to be thinking about that all time now. So um, you've got me completely off track now. So they do bring up a, a, a really good topic, I think, that, that needs to be discussed and sort of worked through in a biblical way. But because they're the only ones kind of talking about it, they sort of get the, the, the most attention because now they're the ones that have brought it up as sort of, and, and I'm not saying they present it this way, but it's seen sort of like, oh, wow, this was like some big kept secret. And these guys are sort of unveiling it. And oh, look at, look at all the teaching they're doing. And one of the things that I think is really important, let's just sort of bring it back. Before uh, we get into these verses, I think it's important to kind of talk about the the origins of demonology. Okay, so I will, I say this all the time, I'm hopefully I'll remember, to link a video down in the description by a professor, Mathis uh, Hinez, I think is how you say his last name. But the point is, he's done extensive study within demonology, the beginnings of demonology, demonology within Judaism, First Temple, Second Temple, all of this. And basically, uh, through his research, he said that demonology in general, just within Judaism, started to happen uh, as uh, they were in the dysphoria, right? So it's sort of Persian Empire. Empire coming out of the dysphoria into the Hellenistic age, which is more of like Alexander the Great, all of that. And the you start seeing a, a demonology and demons and sort of the Jewish people trying to work out what that looks like in a much more real way within like the deuterocanonical works and the Apocrypha. And you really see start seeing it pop up there, which is why, for example, we're going to see this even when we get into the first verse here in Mark, is that you have when Jesus comes on the scene and he starts casting out demons, no one's like, <laughs> like, where'd you, like, where'd the demons come from? Because when you leave the Old Testament, you don't have that sort of language or even this same sort of uh, possession where people are having to be exercised and all this sort of stuff. You don't have that. And so when you get into the New Testament and you get into Mark, especially Mark, I mean, we'll talk about this when we get into the verse of Mark. First chapter of Mark, it's like Jesus on the scene, demon, demon, demons. They're like, well, okay, where? And nobody seems surprised by this. <laughs> and so this is, I think, this is really helpful. His work because he he explains like when you start getting into those apocryphal literatures, it's mentioned a number of times, a lot more extensively than it is obviously in the New Testament. And so um, I think that's just important, the, a very bazillion foot fly overview of where demonology comes from and is beginning to be developed. Uh, you do have that as they come out of the dysphoria, as the Hellenistic age comes about, as you enter into what we would consider the New Testament period, Jesus comes on the scene. There's already a sort of idea within Judaism of this demons, how they work, what it means. There's even uh, in the book of Tobit, I think, like a rabbi suggests you know, I think it's uh, you cook fish and you set it out and the demon has to go somewhere. Like there's all these little intricate worked out details of how you can get rid of demons and what it means and all this sort of other stuff. So anyway, that is there. Now, we're not looking at any of that. <laughs> Just suffice to say that there is a foundation for demonology as we enter into the New Testament so that when we get into these verses, this is why the people are not necessarily surprised by people being oppressed or possessed by these e unclean spirits is actually the word that's used the most within a lot of these texts. So anyway, the first one we're going to get into is, or the first one that Isaiah uses specifically, this is why we're picking these verses, by the way, I'll also link a video in below of where Isaiah specifically says, these are the verses that prove the point, right? This is the only reason we're doing these verses. So the first one, let's go over to our screen here, is Mark chapter 1, specifically verse 39, but obviously this is in a larger context where Jesus is preaching in Galilee, okay? So what are your first, obviously we need to exegete these texts a bit. We need to understand a little bit of the context of what's happening. Verse 39 specifically says, and he went throughout Galilee preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And Isaiah says, well, he's going to the synagogues and the synagogues are the place of worship which is assuming these are followers of, of God at this point, not obviously yeah. Jesus. And so, <laughs> so therefore, demons can possess followers of God because this is where Jesus is going to cast out demons. Um, 
let's kind of work through that a little bit, Rob. What what kind of preliminary exegesis have you done on this to sort of work through this? Uh, well, <clears throat> so I, I think it, you hit it on the head first. The first thing is in this text, you see, um, so Jesus is uh, like be, the paragraph starts in verse 35, right? It says, uh, and in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus rose up, went out of the house and uh, went away to a desolate place and was praying there. And Simon and his companions uh, searched for him. They found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let's go elsewhere to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came out for. And he went preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out the demons. It it actually doesn't say that. Um, it act, it actually doesn't. So you can't you can't infer from this text alone that the demons were even in people, right? Now I think that because uh, because all we know for sure is that they were in the synagogues, <laughs> right? Um, mm -hmm. However, I think logically uh, Jesus doesn't go casting demons out of buildings um, throughout the Gospels. So you can you can you can take it uh, at at its. Uh, you know, like we're not developing uh, doctrine on a verse. Um, and so you can logically assume, right, that that uh, he is in the synagogues and that uh, there are human beings uh, that uh, are possessed by demons and those demons get cast out of them. I think that the the fundamental flaw with the with the uh, Isaiah's assumption is that these folks just because they're in a synagogue are um christian people or or god's people right i think that that's the that's the that's the big hole for me because uh we we're told all over the place in the scriptures in different ways uh right we have we have sheep and goats right and they're gonna uh they're together in the visible church uh, there are people uh we we preach like this right um, like whenever we're preaching to a congregation, we, uh, we don't just assume that, well, you showed up at church today, so you must be, um, a genuine Christian. Uh, we don't, we don't do that, do we? Right? Like, no, we, we proclaim the gospel, uh, and, and I, I attempt to even proclaim the gospel, uh, not only in, in such a way that the people, uh, who are Christians get it again, because we need that, um, but also, there's uh, there's invitation all the time for, uh, you know, uh, like I might say, hey, if if uh, we're getting ready to get into communion, if if uh, you're not a Christian and this isn't for you yet, I yeah. hope that soon mm -hmm. will be like uh, those kinds of things. Right. So we don't we don't just assume that every butt in, the, in every seat is a Christian butt. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think that uh, that's the fundamental flaw with using this particular text for that reason. Um, there's no reason to assume. In fact, um, uh, in, in Revelation, when Jesus talks about the synagogue of Satan, uh, he's talking about actual synagogues. <laughs> he's talking about actual synagogues yeah. with actual people in them that, that aren't believers, that aren't Christians. Um, so anyway, that's the, that's the preliminary, I guess, on that one for me. Yeah. Well, and I think, it, I mean, even, like I said, Mark is full of so if you go a little bit further up, it's uh, starting in verse 21, when Jesus heals the man of the unclean spirit, you'll actually see that. And then they went to Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and he was teaching. So again, this is the Sabbath. They are the synagogue. This would be the thing you were supposed to do anyway. And they were astonished at his teaching. So this is everybody that's obviously in the synagogue where Jesus is teaching. And he taught them with one who had authority uh, and not as the scribes, which I just think that's a funny sort of kick. Like, oh, you have opinions, but you're not authoritative. And so then 23, and immediately there was a, a there's immediately there was in their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit and cried out. And anyway, Jesus cast this out of him. But the point is, again, there are, to your point, um, I think it's easily sort of disproved that obviously not everybody in the synagogue is going to be a follower of Christ. I mean, he says over and over again, I mean, you go through, he even says this to um, the religious leaders, like, yeah, you look good on the outside, but you're, you know, you're whitewashed tombs. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there, there is this outward appearance, but just because someone is attending synagogue, especially, so I think we even have this idea, right? So even in our day, just because you go to church doesn't mean you're a Christian, like everybody knows that. 
there's the same sort of connection with synagogue. I mean, e- there's even a stronger one. You're supposed to go yep. if you're a Jew. You're supposed to be there. Whether, I mean, regardless of your, your piety or you're just doing it out of obligation, the idea is you'll be there. So it shouldn't really be a surprise <laughs> that Jesus is casting demons out of those in synagogue because Jesus is, again, we'll see this in other verses that we look at. His ministry is very little does he even go outside to Gentiles until the Gentiles come to him. Right. And so it's yeah. not as if, so if you're, if you're working on the premise of all the Jewish people are believers of God, then you're, it's a weird premise to start with because why would that assumption even be there that you're, at, you know, you, you couldn't have a demon or what? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think just the premise in general is because, I mean, and that's, that's sort of what he's working on is that, um, and not just Isaiah, but other people as well that kind of follow through this, um, because he's not the first one to say this. But if you're working on the premise that because you were at synagogue, then you must be a follower of God and therefore cannot have a demon, um, or therefore you you can be a believer in God and have a demon. It's a weird sort of line to fall. Again, this is where it goes back to where we don't make a doctrine or a belief system on a few verses. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, um, another thing, uh, to think about just as a, that isn't text specific, but it's something that even in the video that you'll put in the notes, um, he, um, he's, he makes these assumptions and it would be interesting to hear from him. And maybe you, you've done a lot more research on these cats than I have recently. Um, but so maybe, uh, maybe, you know, But it would be interesting to hear from him, like, where do you get information like um, the Holy Spirit is is in your spirit, uh, but a demon can be in your soul? That's a that's a statement that he kind of unequivocally makes. That's how he justifies that a a demon can be in a in a Christian. Um, And I don't know. Uh, I don't know which exact verse he might go to, to, to make that claim, mm-hmm. uh, that particular bit of the claim. I don't think they have, a, I don't, I don't recall them ever having a verse for that specifically. They do appeal to the body, mind, soul, um, sort of, uh, equivocation. Now, again, that's working off. There's so much there to break down as far as like philosophy. Yeah, yeah. And when that philosophy comes about, they do pull, uh, to be fair, um, this is not an episode of Remnant Radio that he was on. This is another episode of Remnant Radio. But they do appeal occasionally to uh, early church fathers that write um, about interactions with people um, that, um, that, that they sort of break up the, I, I believe it's Tertullian, I, I could be wrong on this, which would say <laughs> that you are indwelled by the Spirit, but your flesh is therefore uh, oppressed or demonized by the demon. And therefore, that would be the differentiation. So there is this breakdown of the the totality of a person is body, soul, mind. And therefore, if you are indwelled by the spirit, yes, you can't be indwelled, but you can be oppressed in your flesh. And so there is this very much, okay. broke, and th- this is where uh, there is a breakdown between I have a verse for this versus experience for this. And so that that's sort of the tension there because... Um, there are very few verse, very few early church writings, for example, that you can appeal to that would um, give that sort of differentiation. Like I said, I believe it's Tertullian accounts uh, gives an account in which there was a woman that he uh, worked through, um, uh, cast some demons out of, gets baptized, and then she goes to the theater and uh, comes back re-oppressed. And Tertullian is having this conversation with the demon that has oppressed her and says, hey, how did you get back in? She's a baptized believer. And he says, well, she re-entered my domain, the domain being the theater. And so then he has to go through the process again. And so they appeal to that idea that if, doesn't matter if if you've been a baptized believer, if you go and participate in things, you can be re-oppressed, which is, this is, I have to really mention that again, we're getting off the weeds here outside of the scripture. Yeah. yeah. But um, that is one of like, that's not the norm of the writings. That's like, that's sort of an off, sort of like one off where Tertullian has some sort of interaction with somebody that's re oppressed. Because it, again, I won't get too much farther into this and then we'll go into the next verse. The basic idea within the early church was that there was about a week's worth 
of cleansing and uh, sort of uh, exorcism, if you want to call it, before baptism. You would go to baptism, recite the Apostles' Creed. At the end of the Apostles' Creed, which is not there anymore, but it was at the beginning uh, of sort of when they would use this for baptism, you would say, I renounce Satan and all his works, and then you would get baptized. And it would be the, I am switching teams, baptism is me uh, becoming Christ, uh, dying to myself and rising in Christ. And then um, you'd be, a, obviously, you're in the church, you're a believer. And the idea is that after baptism, you don't have very many at all examples of people being demonized because you've been baptized. Baptism is, again, we don't have, this isn't what this episode is about, but it's a huge, yeah. it's a huge deal in the early church baptism is the entrance into the church. It is this yeah. incredibly significant thing. And um, that's why there, there's this whole debate, even in the early church of rebaptism. If you've already been bat died to Christ and risen yeah. in him, why would you redo that? And yeah. so all that to say, um, you have some like very sort of weird offshoots of some accounts, but in general, it all comes back to that answering your question. They would hold to, indwelt by the spirit, oppressed in the flesh by breaking down spirit, soul, mind, sort of th those sort of categories, which again is philosophy that all came about during the Hellenistic age uh, or a little bit before that. So it's kind of, you're, you're playing with some weird, weird stuff there. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I, I, I think um, again, you know, like I, I um, coming from more of a reformed uh, Baptist kind of camp, uh, I, um, I get the, uh, I mean, and we've, you get accused of uh, developing doctrine off of uh, uh, people's words in church history. Um, but then, but then we, uh, like, like a lot of people, I'm not saying that we're, we're alone in this, but then we would very quickly go, okay, but in the Bible, it says, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I don't think that's super valid to just look at a few stories in church history and and not be able to go, well, it says in Mark, you know, eight or something. Um, yeah. And I think that well, it all comes back. Was a Christian and they, you know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> it seems to be a tension here. Uh, and then we'll get into the Matthew passages. There seems to be a tension in this entire discussion between verses versus experience. When you talk yeah. about yep. this, you're going to continually come up against people that say, yes, but I've experienced X, Y, Z. And so really, I think hopefully what we'll do today as we work through the rest of these verses is be like, all right, well, yeah, that's experience. But how do we then rectify the truth of God's word against your experience then? Because it's not that you yeah. say that experience doesn't matter, but it does have to be held up to the word of God and say, okay, well, through the lenses of scripture, then how do I then therefore interpret this experience? Because one of the things, and then we'll get on to Matthew, that I do not like about the Wesleyans is the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which gives an equal portion to to scripture as it does experience. I mean, you have experience, tradition, scripture, and I forget what the fourth one is, but they're all broken down in a, in a fourth. So your experience weighs nearly as much as what the scripture, like you have to weigh it against these other things. And, and it's just sort of a weird way to view it. Like my experience holds a really weighty thing in it. So, yeah. Yeah. At a most basic level that, that falls apart when you, um, uh, what, there are many, many times when, as a Christian, um, I sin in some way, and and my experience in that moment tells me, "Bro, are you even a Christian? Can you even right?" Like my experience at that moment leads me to like question uh, this whole thing, maybe or whatever. Um, but then I go back to the scriptures, which remind me. No, no, no. He paid it. It's finished. All of these things, right? So you go back to the scriptures to find out truth when and and you don't trust your your feelings and your experience. That's just how it should work. <laughs> yeah. Or, so, or the scriptures say, how true those things are. Yeah. So as we wrap up Matthew, right? Or not Matthew, Mark, this the the general idea is that again, you don't base any doctrine off of one text, not that he's necessarily doing that, but the text in Mark, just because Jesus goes to the synagogue does not mean that you know, Christians can be, believers can't be, or believers can be possessed by demons simply because Jesus goes to the synagogue and casts them out. It's sort of a weird, weird way to view that. So let's get in now to Matthew chapter 16. 
the verse that he specifically cites here is uh, the one that you already referenced, the Peter, Satan, get behind me one, right? So yep. let me pull that yep. up real quick. So we have that here. This is uh, actually starts at verse 21 and it says this, from the time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But then he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of of man. And then obviously Isaiah here would say, well, look, um, this is, this is Satan, uh, either working through Peter or entering Peter. I don't think he actually would ever say he entered Peter. That's a different one. We're going to look at in a different verse, but he's working, uh, working here within Peter, which means that Peter as a follower of Jesus can have a, uh, um, a demon apparently, <laughs> uh, and try to hinder Jesus from completing his work. Yeah, he also says, uh, when he's talking about this, he also says, uh, and many demons will say that they're Satan uh, or something like that. I forget exactly how he worded it, but he, he alluded to oh, the yeah. fact that even mm -hmm. though Satan, it could be any any old demon um, uh, or or any number of demons, at least. Uh, and and I think that one of the things here, um, he Jesus uses this incredibly strong language, right? I mean, that's, there's no getting around that. That's a strong <laughs> statement, right? Like, and this is just after um, Peter had his mind set on the things of God, right? So they'd yeah. just gotten to the, the district of Caesarea Philippi in verse 13. Um, uh, Jesus yeah, I'm says, I'm going to build my, my church on you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, and Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father is in heaven. So he's, he's, his mind in that instance mm -hmm. is on the things above, um, his, his mind is where it should be there. Um, like, uh, so in verse 23, it says God's interest or the things of God, um, th that's where his mind should be, but mm -hmm. there, but it's not, it's on man's interest or uh, the things of man. Um, and, and so I, like, I think that this is meant to be strong language by Christ, but even, um, that this is, this is not meant to, to say at, at all. And it, it doesn't say this, um, that, that Satan is somehow in Peter. Um, it, it, this, if you look at the cross reference there, probably the cross reference right at the word Satan is from Jesus temptation. Um, and, and the idea here is that, mm -hmm. um, is that, uh, um, uh, Peter, <laughs> unbeknownst to him, um, I mean, you got to think about the situation, right? Uh, Peter has just heard these really strong things come from Christ, like, and the gates of hell is, are not going to be able to withstand the church and all of these things. Um, and now he hears, um, you know, I, I have to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. <laughs> and, and Peter, like the reflexive reaction, probably from any of us would have been, bro, you got to calm. There's no way calm down that that can't be true right yeah. <laughs> like um uh, and so he he has a, a but that that reaction that natural reaction that natural reaction from man right um uh is is completely in the way it's completely adversarial uh which is what satan means right it's completely adversarial to uh the the cause of Christ to what he's come to accomplish, which actually includes being, uh, 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 suffering at the hands of the leadership there and dying on that cross. Yeah. Well, and I think again, like what you're saying, th there is this real sort of knee jerk from like, nothing will prevail to, I'm going to go get killed. And then Peter going, what? <laughs> like that can't be right. And I yeah. think I really like what you pulled out there in regards to, really this callback of Satan back in the wilderness, tempting Jesus. Uh, hey, I'll give you all of this thing. I'll give you all of this. And Peter really using some of these same words, far be it. This will never know. You don't have to do that. 
And then Jesus using the get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. Now, I think the word usage after this is really important. It also sort of, I think, disproves the idea here um, that Peter is indwelt by a demon or Satan himself or anything like that. Because Jesus, first of all, clearly can cast out demons. We've seen this throughout the gospel. So if this was the case, this would have already been done um, way before he was called, clearly. But secondly, he's speaking to Peter here. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Like it's your the the way you're yeah. responding is this right? So if the get behind me Satan wasn't there, this wouldn't even be an issue because the idea would be he Jesus would just be like, hey, why are you thinking this way? This isn't the way you should be thinking. But the whole yep. get behind me Satan part then there for now leads again. Isaiah or people within that same thought process be like, oh, but look, it's there, it's there, without, again, understanding, uh, I'm not saying, again, that that Isaiah doesn't understand this. I think he does. I've looked into him enough that I think he really does, but I think that some of his lenses are preventing him to see this clearly. But when you're looking at it from uh, from a specific hermeneutic of what is happening here, and again, looking back on scripture, what's happened before, especially within the wilderness, um, this tie-in is pretty pretty obvious, I think. And I'm really glad you brought that out because it is this uh, adversary coming against. It is Peter really taking a, a posture and position that Jesus has already dealt with in the wilderness against Satan and saying, no, this is not the thing you're supposed to be. Like, your focus is wrong. Yeah. And so I think it's a whole lot deeper, honestly, than this surface level sort of demonology. Look, Peter's possessed. And it's much more like your mind, when it is opposed to the things of God, are in line with the things of Satan. Not that you're demonized, not that you are Satan, but the way you're thinking is not in line with the way that God is yeah. thinking. It is and within, again, within, within Christian thought, if it's not aligned with God, well, who's it aligned with? There's only one other option. <laughs> There's not like yep. a plethora of paths here. <laughs> it is either aligned with God or aligned with Satan. And so I think it's a really smart call out that you made there that the fact that he's not aligned with the things of God then therefore makes him aligned with the things of Satan. Not that he is yeah. following Satan, not that he's possessed right. by a demon. It's just that in that moment, he needs rebuked. And to be fair, there's lots of times probably that Jesus would give the give some of us the same rebuke. Like your mind is not on the things of heaven; mm -hmm. it is on the things of man. Uh, yeah, daily probably at at, at, at different points, right? Uh, yeah, I think that um, this the the one of the um, so first of all, if you were going to preach through this text, and I did not, not incredibly long ago, um, uh, verses twenty one through twenty three would probably be your your main bit there, right? Cause that's mm -hmm. the paragraph. That's the, the whole thing. <clears throat> this you're, you're getting to this point in Matthew where Jesus is beginning to, uh, well, this is the beginning of that from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples. So he's, he's actually beginning to, sh to, to teach about this fact that he's what he's going to go do, right? This is going to happen to him. Uh, he knows about it already. He's going there anyway. And it, notice he says, and be killed. And by the way, be raised up on the third day. So, uh, I mean, he's talking about the whole of the victory here. It's funny uh, how Peter but, doesn't pick that point up, like the resurrection right. part. <laughs> he hears suffer and be killed and those kinds of things. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, um, you know, like when you say something in church that offends someone and like that's the last thing in the sermon they hear. The <laughs> same kind of thing, right? Um, and <clears throat> so I think uh, one of the um, applications that, that we can take away from this as Christians from this particular text, I don't think that you can definitively say, hey, uh, 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 one of the ways this applies to you is you might be Satan. You, you might have Satan in you. Um, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that's what it means. And I don't think that you can, you can do that to the text. How, uh, at least, at least not dogmatically like he does, right? You can make whatever assumptions you want to make, but, um, uh, but, but I think that the, the, the goal here, or at least one of the goals here, uh, application wise for us as Christians is, um, you can pretty easily inadvertently, um, or even even as a as a, a reflex um, uh, at times, end up uh, on the wrong team, at least in the moment, 
right? Mm-hmm. You can yeah. you can end up uh, working in such a way that you're actually aiding the enemy instead of being at war with them. Um, I mean, that's that's what it's about. <laughs> yeah. Well, and <laughs> I, mean, I think that, that, yeah, and th- that's uh, again. I think uh, I've said this before a thousand times. We're we're actually teaching through on Wednesday nights currently. Uh, trying to you know teach people how to do better exegetical work in their personal Bible study, the different forms of hermeneutics, so they can read that better. And this this comes across a lot. Like the thing I've said over and over again so far is that like there's a surface level reading that you'll get sometimes, and that seems like all profound. But when you actually exegete the text and view it in the way it's supposed to be, it's actually not only a lot deeper than you first perceived it to be, but it's so much more important than your first like, oh, j- knee-jerk yeah. reaction to this, right? And so the reality is like the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, well, look, Peter is possessed by a demon that calls himself Satan or whatever, like thing yeah. you want to say there. But when you dig into it, right, the reality here, again, within the whole of Matthew of what we're getting to with like what you mentioned before with the, the sort of this juxtaposition of, you know, nothing will overcome to I've got to go die. The reality is, again, I think the application is so much more powerful there. You could be at different times in your day or in your life thinking you're doing the right thing and actually being on the wrong team. And I think that's much more profound and much more of a sanctifying, you know, for the believer to understand that and to really process that in, okay, I'm doing this. Am I doing this with the right motives versus I said one thing, I might be possessed by a demon, right? It's just like, it's, there's, we mentioned this a lot in the last set of podcasts. There, there's so much more fear attached to one of them and so much more peace attached to the other of, of mm-hmm. understanding, again, what you already said. I'm walking with the Lord. He's gracious to call me out and to correct me versus, oh, no, I how do I get rid of this thing that I didn't even know I had? And there's just this, it's just this, when you view the scriptures the way that they are asking you to view them, <laughs> there's so much more alive and deep and um, helpful to you as a believer. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, it, this, this can, the interpretation that he takes of this, uh, particular text and, and of many we'll find out, I'm sure, uh, the interpretation that he takes, um, actually has the ability. And I would say, uh, it, it's, it makes it probable even that, um, that this is, that a person is going to, um, miss, um, miss what actually needs to be gotten out of from this text and therefore will not grow in the way that God has meant and intended for them to grow uh, by applying this text correctly to our lives. Um, and, and so you end up like stunting your growth by doing this crap, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. Um, well, yeah, that's a great, <clears throat> not to interrupt you, but that's a great point. So this is the issue a lot with like bad theology or bad doctrines is that they, yeah, just in general, they'll stunt you and leave you in a place in which you think you're pretty good and you miss out on a lot more sanctification, a lot deeper theology and understanding of God because you're now like you're praying for the breakthrough when the thing you're going, you're praying to break, get broken through is actually maybe a sanctifying work that God is doing in your life. And so, yeah, it's just, I, that was a great point. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that was good. Oh, now, we, yeah. If I was in the front row, I'd be like, Hey man, <laughs> I'm getting mic'd up. So <laughs> I should put, I should, we should have studio audience, Michael. Oh, well, I, I do we have technically have, have two house. people in my house right now, but they're both sleeping. So no oh. one's going to aim me oh. right now. So yeah. Hey, just like church. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's move on to the John passage. We are going to be uh, in John chapter thirteen now, right? Um, let me pull that up. Now, this is um, at Jesus being betrayed, betrayed by Judas, right? So we have in John chapter thirteen. If you technically start at verse twenty-one, it'll work all the way to twenty-seven, which is again. This was an interesting one for me to prove that that believers can have demons. But anyway, let's, let's work through it and then we'll talk about it. 
So verse 21 starts this way in John chapter 13. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus whom he was speaking. So the disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is the one whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon uh, Iscariot, uh, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said, Do what you are going to do, do uh, what you are going to do, do quickly. And then it goes on, obviously, for the rest of the text that goes on there. Um, I just want to say before we actually start getting into this, the tension in the room after Jesus says, whoever I hand this morsel to, I feel like would have been pretty thick. Like, it would be like, who in the world? Like, I ain't touching it. I, nope, 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 I ain't doing it. <laughs> like, you would not reach it for me. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, I can't imagine uh, being sitting, um, sitting in in that room that that would have been and especially especially i was getting ready to say it like like you said especially if you're uh sitting there and you have to be thinking wait a minute he can't be talking about me right like oh no it's just just like (laughs) oh who's he gonna hand it to who's he gonna hand it to yeah (laughs) <laughs> anyway it's just it's just you're funny to, again that I'm taking a bathroom break like oh I gotta yeah I gotta go I gotta yeah, I don't want to be here for this I gotta I go see a chance <laughs> yeah anyway know. so the the verse that he's talking about specifically is obviously verse 27 uh then after he had taken it talking about Judas um, Satan, entered in, Satan entered into him and Jesus said to him what you are going to do do quickly right so this idea again um, he, Isaiah would appeal to the, this verse as proof that a, a believer, a follower of Jesus can be possessed, uh, or oppressed by uh, a demon specifically saying that Satan himself entered, entered Judas here. Uh, yeah, well, there's, um, Judas has a special place in, um, in the whole plan of um he's got a special role in the whole big scheme of things um and in fact uh in john chapter 10 um let me find that quick or is it while you're finding that i think this is i think what we're going to find here is maybe this is where theological distinctions and positions actually like are important and show up in, in as far as how, how some of this sort of is is uh, looked at. So did you find it? You got John? Okay, no, go ahead. This is where they okay. show up. Yeah, so I think some of this, right? So I don't know if you're going to mention this or not, but there have definitely been people before that when you're talking about, um, you know, God, for example, preordaining certain things using certain people. So you have, for example, the, you know, when you would, we were talking about at the beginning of this episode, uh, the, the Persians, right? Well, you have... Jeremiah talking about how God is going to use foreign kings to punish his people. So obviously he raises up kings, specifically uses them to do certain things, to make certain things happen. Um, So you have the king of Babylon risen up so that the Jews will go into exile. You have the king of Persian risen up so that they will come out of the dysphoria. And the, you know, the Jeremiah being very clear that these kings are doing God's will. Like he is allowing this to happen for a specific reason. And then you have, and we might get into this here, Jude, uh, Judas sort of playing that same sort of sort of piece in the overarching story where he is being uh, used by God to do certain things to bring forth certain outcomes. Um, and so I'm sure that we might get into that. Maybe we won't. But um, so when you get to verse 27 and Satan, Satan enters into him, and Jesus says, well, go do what you're going to do. Do it quickly. Um, can yeah. be seen sort of in that same light. <clears throat> Just a, a, a side note. Um, before, before it says Satan entered into him, um, n- uh, note that up at the beginning of the chapter, um, 
let's see, it says in, in verse two, and during supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon to betray him. So he's already under the influence of, of the evil one. Uh, right. And, uh, so Satan entering into him, I think, uh, is exactly what it sounds like. Um, I don't think that we, we have to wordplay this at all. Um, however, Jesus legit calls him in John 17. I was mistaken on the chapter. This, so this is part of the high priestly prayer. Jesus legit calls him the son of perdition. Now, do we know what perdition means? Uh, the, the idea there is eternal damnation. <laughs> uh, um, and Not a good nickname to have. <laughs> not, no, no, absolutely not. Um uh, in, in verse 12, it is right. Uh, Jesus is in the midst of praying to the father. And he says, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name. So he's talking about the, the disciples. I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition so that the scripture would be fulfilled. So he has, uh, I mean, Jesus in, in John 10, what I was thinking of is Jesus says that uh, he's, he won't lose one of his sheep like it just flat out says that like no questions asked no caveats no disclaimer uh, uh i'm i'm not going to lose any of them my father who's greater than all uh has them in his hand and um no one can take them out of the father's hand uh no one is able he says to take them out of the father's hand um uh, but the son of perdition um so of of those who um followed Christ, who you could say were disciples of Christ. Uh, Judas is called the son of perdition by Christ in this prayer, meaning that um, the, the Godhead um, had, you know, no matter what you think about Calvinism, in this instance, um, uh, at least God had uh, eternally damned Judas, uh, period. He was meant to play this role. This is what was going to happen. And uh, and so when uh, it says Satan entered into Judas, I don't think that we're talking about um, a Christian here. Yeah, that, I, that was my point. It, yeah. yeah. It's a weird clearly, passage to pull out for that. It is, because Judas is is the most clear example in the scriptures of a goat. Um. And and I think you know one of the things that like the the Isaiah uh, type of folk will will bring out is yeah yeah but Judas I heard this uh, someone um, someone else talking about this oh well but Judas was one of the uh, uh, disciples that was sent out to cast in, in uh, Matthew ten to cast out demons and and all of these things right so Judas uh, by the power of Christ cast demons out. And healed people. That's the assumption, right? I mean, oh, yeah, 100%. There's yeah. no reason to, to Which is think also otherwise. Why the other verses there, some will come to me and say, but Lord, we did these things. Right. Yeah, exactly right. Like, I don't, I do not think uh, that, um, that Judas is an example either of a, a genuine Christian who fell from the faith or of a genuine Christian who uh, was possessed by Satan at the end of his life. <laughs> Um, I, I think that the whole point of Judas is th this guy was actually, he was the, the epitome of, he went out of us because he was not, uh, he went out from among us because he was never of us. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you have that sort of within the gospels laid out anyway, this idea that he's a zealot, uh, his, his, again, it, it, this is why it's important to understand church or just history, not just church history, but just history. The zealots were about uprising and overthrowing the empire. And Judas thinks that Jesus is going to do that. It seems to be just by his name and the identification that he's given throughout the gospels is that Judas thinks that yet yeah, he does think Jesus is the Messiah, but he's not a, a humble Messiah that's going to die. He's a Messiah with a sword that's going to overthrow. And so this is why he follows him. And so um, this, again, I think all the verses you've already pointed out and the ones, uh, you know, this, this idea that just because he did miraculous things does not mean he was a follower. And I think this is, again, scripture points this out. There will be people that be, stand before God and say, but I did all of these things. And it's not the things like it, the scary, really the scary part 
should be that you can still do those things and still not be a follower. That should be the terrifying part. Not the seeking of science to prove that you are, but the fact that you can do that and still not be. Like, and so this is, I, I think like what you already said, it's a perfect example. Judas is like the poster child for this. This, this I can you know, do all these things, but you're still not there and you're still not his. And I think this is where this breakdown, I think really occurs with people. Cause they're like, well, how are we, how are we ever supposed to know who's a Christian? Well, I think it's a Spurgeon quote, you know, Spurgeon better than I do, but I think it's one where he said, where somebody asked him about predestination and he goes, no, you know, those that are predestined don't have like a yellow mark on their back. So I just go around assuming everyone does and let God sort it out. I just, I evangelize as if everyone is, and I let him do it. Cause I don't know who is. And I think this still sort of falls within Judas's thing, right? Like he appears to be a follower. He even does some of the things that the other disciples do. But at the end of the day, he really kind of falls into the same thing as Peter, where he has this intent that he, he wants his own motives to be done. And so he, he, again, instead of, you know, Jesus telling Judas, get behind me, Satan, um, Judas just keeps going down his own path and his own desires and not the things of God. And again, I think there, there's, there is a reality of what you've already said, where he was already a son of perdition. He was already destined for this. And I know people don't like that, but we all throughout scripture, we see God using people to do his thing at certain times. Um, that's not like some foreign concept we don't see in scripture. Yeah, and uh, so uh, so here's some definitive uh, stuff I think about what when we talk about Judas um, being a goat, right, or, or like not being a genuine believer, <clears throat> which is the argument, by the way, right? Like yeah. this is this the argument what, that he is a genuine believer. That's the argument, right? He is a Christian, and he was possessed by Satan. That's that's what they would say, um, and so the very famous first Corinthians chapter six, uh, text, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves. That's important. Nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor viler, nor swinders will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Now, when Paul says this, um, uh, when he's writing this um, down for the Corinthian church, uh, he is uh, talking to believers, correct? Yes, this, yes, that's the audience. If you read the beginning of 1 Corinthians, he's talking to the, the true Christians in the Corinthian church. Um, and and uh, he says, such were some of you. So even though those people, I just had this conversation with someone, this particular one about this text, even though these folks uh, might still struggle with, say, sexual immorality or might still be given to like thievery, like uh, taking long breaks at work and thieving time from your boss, those kinds of things, even though they might still be uh, struggling with these things, they no longer are identified as those things, are they? Isn't that what such were some of you means? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That's, that's no longer who you are. Right. OK. John 12. Um, Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was going to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to take from it what was put into it. So Judas, this is just a statement about who he is here. This is a statement about like this didn't happen once. And then he repented. This oh, is yeah. just something that, that the disciples knew of him. He he was uh, someone who, it seems like by this statement, consistently, <laughs> uh, at least fairly consistently, uh, took money like it was his uh, out of the money box that was meant for their ministry. John's over um, here like, I'm taking notes, bro. I'm, I, I see you. I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it can be more definitive than that. But like Judas is yeah. just known as this guy. Yeah, that was, and again, to be fair, I want to make a point just in case you've gotten this far in the podcast and like just to, again, clarify exactly what we're doing. One, these verses are what Isaiah and others are using to say that Christians can be possessed yes. or oppressed, right? So 
we're not even discussing non-believers in this whole thing. This is specifically can believers, and these are the verses used to prove that believers are. So I just want to make sure we're very clear on that. So um, the next one we want to go to, there's a couple after the Gospels, but I want to use the, save those for last. So let's go to Mark chapter 7. This is another one he uses. I know I'm doing this a little bit out of order for you. I'm sorry about that. Mark chapter 7, verse 24 is where we're going to start. Um, now, this is one of the instances that uh, the Syrophoenician woman, this is one of the instances that I mentioned earlier. Jesus does have some interactions with Gentiles, though they are they are few, uh, but normally they come to him. Um, I think I think in every instance, actually, they come to him. And so this is one of the, this is one of the more key verses, right? So this isn't, I haven't just heard Isaiah say this. I've heard Mike, um, gosh, it starts with an S. Anyway, Signorelli. Signorelli. I got a real issue with that name, apparently saying like, it. Like, like sign, only okay. you pronounce the G. <laughs> Signorelli, Mike Signorelli. He uses this all the time. Andrew Pagani uses this all the time. Isaiah uses this. Uh, and specifically, there's going to be a verse here. Uh, the, it, the children's bread is the thing they say all the time. This is like their go-to verse when it comes to um, why, specifically, not only that can, can Christians have demons, but why deliverance is such an important part of what should be a part of the church. Like they use this at, I mean, they just beat this verse to death <laughs> when it comes to this. So here, here's the text, Mark chapter seven, verse 24, starting there. And it says this, and from there, he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered into the house and did not want anyone to know yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. And the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs uh, under the table uh, eat the children's crumbs. Now we could go obviously more, but the idea here is that the children's bread is the verse that they really latch on to here. Saying that she's coming to him, the context of the verse is that her daughter is possessed by an unclean spirit. She asked Jesus to cast it out. His rebuttal seems to be, I don't do that for Gentiles because I'm not going to take something from the children, which is his people, and give it to those that are not his people. And so obviously he ends up doing it anyway. Um, and this is a whole like controversy. <laughs> This this verses this, this section of verses is a whole different thing within progressivism about Jesus being correct and whatnot, which we're not going to get into. But oh yeah, this Jesus is a racist. I, yeah, <laughs> but Mike Signorelli, Isaiah, Oof, Andrew yeah. Pagani, all of these guys use this as the reason. I mean, the number one. I'm sure they have others, but this is the number one reason that deliverance ministry isn't just important, but it is for believers not unbelievers. Uh, so, yeah. So that, this is why, for example, they would, I haven't ever heard them argue this, but I can definitely see this line of logic where they would say, this is the reason we don't go to the streets and possess demons out of all the crazy people on the streets because they're not even believers. This is why we do it in churches because it is the children's bread. And that is sort of the, the way they use this verse. Um, so this is why he points this out just to be super clear. Obviously, it does have something to do with demon, uh, unclean spirits and demon possession, but that that bread verse is specifically um, kind of what what he him and others latch on to for that. So um, I, I know wow. so this is never. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> yeah, so we're kind of coming at this at two different ways now. So obviously, we're coming at it uh, at the the claim of believers can have that's the reason we're doing this podcast is because his claim is that believers can have demons but clearly in this passage that's not what's happening the little girl's not a believer the reason he uses this is because he says jesus is claiming that the children's bread is deliverance from unclean spirits and that's his argument based on this passage uh well, so I know, yeah, this is a little weird because I'm sure you haven't really had a lot of time to prep for that part, <laughs> but no, and it's um, not a common interpretation of this passage by any means. No, because it's crazy. 
<laughs> exactly. Not, well, I mean, it's it, not what this is. Yeah. Yeah. As you formulate, so I'm going to give you a minute to formulate your thought. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to say something. I think this is why, again, it's, and this is one of the reasons, for example, I, I, when I was asked what I wanted to teach our, our Wednesday night Bible study on next was why I wanted to do what, one of the reasons I want to do exegetics and hermeneutics, because it's really easy that if you don't understand the very basic terms in which we interact with the scripture, that you can come away with things from the scripture that um, that are very much colored by the lenses, your very modern lenses, right? So, I, I to give an example, uh, Isaiah would come out of, and he he wouldn't cl- claim himself to be like a Pentecostal. He would say he's charismatic, but he names a bunch of people which their names are escaping me now, that sort of pioneered the deliverance ministry movement of the 80s and 90s. And so like Chuck Pierce, for example, um, those sort of guys that like he has inadvertently learned from and gets picks up their lenses, their hermeneutical lenses from. And so when he comes to a passage like this and, it, and Jesus is saying, hey, you know, why would I give you the children's bread? Instead of exegeting this passage in a way that would say that Jesus has come primarily for the Jews, and this is his point, he then takes that as deliverance because that's what's happening specifically here is very yeah. much sort of microscopic down to and microscopic isn't a word, but it's it's <laughs> it's pinpointed to now mean something very specific about demon possession and deliverance rather than the wider thing that we've already discussed. I believe it was in Matthew where Jesus says, this is the purpose that I've come. Right. And so he, Jesus' ministry continually with the exception of a few Gentiles that he interacts with is for his people. And this, I think within the hermeneutic, when you're just reading through, it's very clear that this is what he's talking about. Not that demon you know, deliverance is just for the Jewish people or just for his people, but in general that he has come for the Jews and she is a Gentile Syrophoenician woman. So, uh, yeah, I, and I think, um, so yeah, you're right. Like the point of the text is, is about the Gentile versus Israelite thing. Um, more than it's about any demon possession that just that's that just happens to be part of the story part of the the, scenario yeah right yeah yeah um this i think too um so uh i was i was like three-fourths listening to you i got i threw you with the uh, you've never heard of this background before yeah yeah so i'm 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 looking at the same time um and the the bread uh is a, a common illustration, right? Obviously, um, uh, it, and again, this, a lot of this is just coming from the top of my head. So like you may, we may all go back through this and be like, Oh, that dude's a heretic. But, um, but bread, bread is a really common illustration. Um, uh, it was actually one of the, uh, the illustrations essentially was a bread like thing, like the manna, right. Um, mm-hmm. and, and all the way back then. And, uh, after the Exodus, Um, and then Jesus later said, what, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Um, uh, uh, so he is the bread of life. Um, and, uh, my, my, uh, without looking into this in in depth, really, my, uh, first take on this is, uh, is that Jesus himself is the bread he's talking about here, that this ministry, this thing that I'm doing um, not, not just, uh, uh, demon possession and, and casting out demons, but the whole thing, um, he's coming to bring the gospel and the offer of the gospel and the King has come, um, that, that is, uh, to the Jew first and also, and, and, and then to, right. And also the, the Gentile. Um, so I, I just, I, I am at a loss as to how someone could <laughs> exegetically yeah, well, come up with, you know, like, like walk away from yeah. this verse going, see, yep, we should cast demons out of people in the church. So two um, things, two things. I think your initial reaction. There's some long jump going on here. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think your initial reaction actually encapsulates really when you're used to approaching the scripture in a historically exegetical, faithful way, that explanation makes you go, what? <laughs> like the, like your first reaction of just like, I never, I have never in my life heard that before. I think that just demonstrates, I, I think that's the proper reaction <laughs> because there's no way you can get that out of here. Secondly, I think your take is, is accurate because if you go further down in the verses, when she does say, yeah, but Lord, even the dogs under the table get some of the children's crumbs. And he says, and he said to her, for your statement, you may go, you're on your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found, right? So there's this, this, this reality that she has the faith that he is, uh, if, if not the Messiah, which she would have had some probably sense of that the Jewish were anticipating this messiah as figure. But the idea is that she does give him respect, the, like the, the title Lord there, yes, Lord. There is this respect given to him that even, even though I am a dog, even though I'm not of the children, right? Which she would have clearly, within the cultural dynamics of the day, understood that. Like yep. she's, that would have been understood. Um, it's, it's in her faith and still asking that he then gives her that, which plays in again to what you were saying about the, you know, he comes, but the faith is first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, which we see later. Even uh, the grafting onto the branches uh, verses, which I'm forgetting, but um, plays into this. Galatians. But, yeah, but the idea here of, I, I think the only way you can get to that point, right? Again, and this is this this is the verse that Isaiah points out in the video that I've linked to the description. This isn't. I'm not pulling this out saying he says this. This is the verse that he lists when he says Christians can have demons. This is proof that deliverance is for the church. He's saying this, not me. <laughs> And yeah. So, so, and another thing about that is, is that, so by the way, I was wrong. It, it's Romans chapter 11 that the grafting, the grafting stuff yeah. takes place. Um, but, um, but they're also taking this one thing as prescriptive. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Right. The, like this is, and, and that's a, that's a major issue within um, kind of like the charismatic movement is this like prescriptive versus descriptive thing. Um. And that's just a, yeah. I mean, if you're unfamiliar with that and you're listening or whatever, that all all that means is um, you come is is a text describing something that happened or prescribing something for all time that like a way of like function like this is what we all should be doing. Um, is it is it prescribing to us how we're supposed to live the Christian life or how we function as a church or that kind of thing? Um, and so there's this argument, particularly around some charismatic kind of theology uh, throughout the book of Acts and other places. And, and apparently here, right, like that, this is what they're doing to this particular text. This is a descriptive text. Um, this is this is not something that that we um, this isn't Jesus prescribing a way that uh, pastors or uh, demon slayers or, or whatever uh, are supposed to act, uh, henceforth. <laughs> um, this is, this is a descriptive narrative in, in the gospel account, uh, of Christ. And it, and it has, it has nothing to, he's not saying here, uh, go do this. Um, in, well, in this if he was, the logic would follow that the disciples after Pentecost or, uh, well, specifically with Paul would be like, no, you can't go to the Gentiles. Like, <laughs> like it, I right. mean, pres prescribing, if, if it's prescriptive that the bread is only for the children and not for the dogs, then Paul's entire ministry is like, you can't do that <laughs> at all. Right. Yeah. And, and not only that, but, um, like, where is this? Um, again, I went ahead to a different one. We're in Luke 13, right? Or Mark uh, 7, 24. We, yeah. Mark 7, 24. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm pretty sure that Jesus, I, I haven't looked at this, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but Jesus probably cast demons out of people who are unbelievers after this. Well, I, and he based the very fact that he did it here. Yeah. Negates well, their entire. <laughs> and not only that, assignment. I think not that again, that we're, this isn't the topic that we're talking about. We're specifically talking about the proof text that Isaiah gives, but the fact that Jesus doesn't even have to see the girl and says, yeah, the demon's gone. It kind of puts into question the whole why why do you even need to have mass deliverance why don't you just say hey your faith you know healed and the demon's gone now 
I mean, yeah. Doesn't he say that you'll do things greater than these? <laughs> that verse is also entirely taken out of context. But anyway, so <laughs> that's not the one and we're talking. Probably not in the Bible. But go ahead. Okay, but so uh, here we go. So yeah, so there's that. I, I think, again, I think before we move on, we're going to, I think the next one going to be Matthew 10, because I want to stay within the Gospels first. Matthew 10 verses 5 through 15 will be at next. But as we sort of go and sum this Mark one up, I think this is just a good example, a great example of coming to a text and using your theological lenses, which, by the way, to, to be fair to Isaiah and the Demon Slayers, we all have, we all have these theological lenses that are built in by our growing up or who we read or, you know, the, yep. the, the, the college we went to. And so it's important to come to those and say, how can I be as unbiased as possible and interpret this? Um, and I think Rob's reaction was uh, great because like, I've never heard that before because it is an odd take. It's not a truly exegetical take on that text by any means. Um, it's definitely developed. You first of all have to have this idea of demonology first before you can yeah. even prescribe that as like, oh, this is what that means. Yeah, I can't imagine anyone um, would read this text without having any experience with anything I can't imagine. I think that you would, you would, um, you would sooner come to the like Jesus was a racist conclusion than you this. Come to conclusion. the progressive conclusion. Yeah, no, it's true. You know what yeah. I, mean? <laughs> like, I think even that makes more sense to someone who doesn't know any of the. Well, if you're coming with the just the historical know. literal reading, yeah, yeah, yeah. If if you just read the text and you don't, and it's the first time you picked a Bible up and you read this, you're not going to think that. Yeah that that even someone untrained is that you have to come to that with some specific lenses already built mm -hmm. um to come to that conclusion yeah because it doesn't make any sense no. i loved your reaction like i i don't know <laughs> so let's go let's go to matthew chapter 10 this is going to be the next one we go to matthew chapter 10 verses 5 through 15 now this is uh, a text that rob you've actually already mentioned when we were talking about judas um this mm. because judas is presumably um here with i'm sorry <laughs> i just need to stop muting it and just leave it unmuted the whole time so this is matthew chapter 10 starting at verse 5 says this these uh, these twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town uh, of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost uh, house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopard, cast out demons. You received without pain, now give without pay. And then it goes on, obviously, further. Isaiah's point here. And specifically in the video that I'm referencing that I'm getting these verses from, that he's saying that Jesus specifically sends the disciples to cast out demons out of God's people. Because this is, when he says, the house of Israel, go proclaim saying, and then they're supposed to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopard, cast out demons. So he's connecting um, the fact that the house of Israel is the people of God, the casting out demons, meaning the people of God can have demons. And then he overlays that on the New Testament church, uh, to mean the same thing. So now the people of God, you need to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopard, cast out demons. I always find it interesting that casting out demons isn't hard. The raising the dead part, that's super hard. So, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I, I probably, um, yeah, th those seem both, both fairly out of reach for me. Um, I, I, I think that the phrase lost sheep is really the, <laughs> the whole thing here um and uh he's he's not saying uh necessarily uh so this is their target audience this yeah. is who they're going on behalf of what that doesn't mean is that the particular sick the particular dead that are raised the particular lepers that are cleansed and that the particular people who have demons cast out of them are those lost sheep. The message that accompanies those miracles are for the lost sheep mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and certainly of the house of Israel. Um, but I, I mean, even if, even if we're talking about um, uh, Peter and, and them go to uh, uh, a person um, 
who it, who is one of these lost sheep of the house of Israel, and they cast a demon out of that person. Lost is an important word there. Yeah, <laughs> um, they're not um, they're not goats. Um, they're sheep, mm -hmm. but they're lost sheep. They they aren't um, found sheep yet, yeah. <laughs> right? So uh, th so short version is these are not Christians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So no matter how you slice and dice that, uh, th this is this is no different than a guy like me from my theological perspective saying we go evangelize uh, the lost. We go evangelize um, uh, people who uh, because what we're doing. So in my, I'm, I'm clearly at this point in history, everyone knows I'm a Calvinist. They're very um, clear. There are people in the comments that hate that too, but yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well they'll live through it. Um, uh, providentially. Um, and um, so that there, this is, this is uh, like us saying um, God is uh or, or we we go evangelize uh, because we don't know who the sheep are and who the goats are. Uh, we don't know what that looks like. We don't know um, uh, who someone is the way that God does. Um, and so we evangelize everyone, right? Um, <clears throat> lost sheep uh, would be, in, in my uh, opinion, <clears throat> would be those who are going to come to the faith but who have yet to do so. Mm. So, I, I mean, this is a Mary Magdalene, right? Like that kind of thing. Uh, so, I, like, I don't, I don't see how you could come come up with what they come up with here, I guess, is the, no. the short well, way to say it. Again, but, yeah. I think, to say it for the 50th time, if someone is listening to this podcast all the way through, and not in the broken up by verse things that were episodes, but... I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it probably even more is that when you approach it with a, with an, with a hermeneutic that the scripture demands that you approach it with, then you're going to see, first of all, just the overarching story here that's happening. I mean, by the time we're here, we're already in Matthew 10, you're going to see, um, Again, you're going to pick up the words that you're what you've already talked about, the lost house of Israel. You're going to pick up the um, the idea of what what are they doing? Well, they're going to the lost house for why to proclaim the kingdom as a hand. How are they going to demonstrate the kingdom as a hand by these things that happen? And they're going to go do these things just be, because they've been given it. So now go do it. And so within that understanding, like you said, I think you really, really have to work at this idea that these are followers of, of Yahweh, <laughs> like just in the traditional Jewish sense, right? This is the same sort of concept that we talked about when we talked about the synagogue passage. Like it's very likely these, these, these Jews that they're going to are probably going to synagogue. Probably, I mean, they've, all, they've been taught the Torah, so they, they, they know of who Yahweh is. They would claim Yahweh probably, even if they're Hellenistic, Jews, they would claim Yahweh in some shape or form. And so he's going, yeah, but go to them proclaiming the kingdom of heaven that's coming, that this, this kingdom they've been told about, this Messiah that they've been told is coming, tell them that the kingdom is at hand. And there is this, just like we see in Acts, there is this accompanying of signs as a demonstration of that kingdom for them because they yeah. need that. Um. Some of these verses, like like this one, like you said, are just confusing. <laughs> like why you would use this as your proof text <laughs> right. for why it's, it's, Christians it's can be demonized. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It to make that point specifically. Right. It, this this makes no sense to use this for that. Um, and and it like. It's it's such butchering of the text. Uh, like you have to you have to take it so far beyond what it's saying. Or in this case, I think you you actually have to scribble out a few words <laughs> to 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 attempt to make your point. Um, and I like they they have already done this enough that uh, 
that they're not trustworthy. Right. And I think that's the difficult thing, right? Uh, like if, if this is how you use the scriptures and, um, and every one of the scriptures that we've covered thus far in this, uh, in this, uh, journey here, um, they've, uh, I mean, not just, uh, missed an application, but completely changed the meaning of the text to something that no one would ever come up with as the meaning of the text. Um, and so in, in that instance, like stop teaching, yeah. stop speaking authoritatively about anything. So I do want to interject here. <laughs> Not that this will happen because I would just like to publicly say, as I've already said, I sent Isaiah a message about the video I made about it. Never got a reply. So I don't mm. have any expectation that he will actually respond to this, but I think I can speak for you, Rob. You can speak for yourself clearly in a minute. But I, and I think probably Rob would be more than happy to sit down and go through these verses with you to pick your brain more about why you think these are accurately representing your possess your position because they, they don't seem to. Like, it's one of those things where, and I think we covered this when we covered the Alexander Pagani and Mike Signorelli video, is that, especially with Pagani, he talks so fast and jumps to thousand different verses mm -hmm. that it's hard to peg him down instead of saying, okay, just stop here though. Like just stop on this verse. Yeah. Show me in this section, how that makes your point. And that's what I would really encourage anybody that holds any position to do like, all right, fine. This is one of your proof texts. Great. Let's work through it. Like I got an hour. Let's do it. Like, let's work through this and see, does this actually say what it says? Because anybody can say this verse, this verse, this verse, 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 proves my point. Yeah. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because, look, I am more than happy to, 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 to change my mind <laughs> on things if they can be proven in Scripture. But if you give me verses and then I work through those verses and it clearly says the opposite of what you're saying, how am I supposed to take you seriously is my point. And so, like, I'd be more than happy to sit down, not even publicly. I could care less if it's videotaped. I just, right. to, yeah. to, to say, like, where do you get this from, from the scripture when you're looking at it exegetically? And like you said, to your point as well, like, if you can't handle scripture correctly, I have a real problem <laughs> with, with you teaching people a doctrine that can't be backed up by the handful of proof texts that you've you've literally said these are the ones that I would go to. So just to say that I do want to interject that here. So, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I would, I would absolutely be willing to do that. Um, with the understanding ahead of time that, um, that we're not going to do the jump around. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, like yeah. I'm, I'm not interested in doing that because then you actually get nowhere. Um, and this is, this is what we have to do with issues like, um, like Calvinism and Arminianism or like eschatology, which is hugely debated or this. Well, there's you, a reason you know, that Mike Winger has an 11 hour video on women in ministry. It's not because he wanted to take 11 hours. <laughs> right. It, it's oh my gosh, that's insane. Um, that, uh, but, um, but this that that's not something that's productive right so if 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 your idea of a conversation is let's just jump all over the place no i what i want to do is uh work through like say matthew 10 and this this bit here or whatever or the luke 13 10 or mark 7 24 or whatever it is work through these and um at one at a time and uh it exegetically um, using original language and all the things, um, uh, can you use this one anymore, right, or not? Um, and if not, then you should commit to not using this one anymore, right? Like, yeah. I think I think that's 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 an important bit, right? If if even if you walk away with two verses that you still after we talk through it or whatever that you still kind of feel like oh this this is still um uh, uh in the in the uh clip <laughs> right we can still fire these couple of rounds off um uh great right but some of these are so ludicrous um and outside of 
what anyone's understanding has been um, of of these texts that uh, I think you got to stop using them. I mean, just <laughs> um, and and so uh, like I I would be perfectly willing to have conversation with anybody, um, but it's we're not going to do the jump around and dance around it so you can still use those texts at the end of the day. I want to know definitively is that what that means here, and if it's not, then you should commit to stop. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's just that's just honest Bible study. I mean, just right. I, I, I mean, the, yeah. approach the text, look at it through, a, you know, a hermeneutic that it demands to be looked at through, and then exegete the text as it needs, as as, as it has given you <laughs> leading to to do. I mean, there's reasons that it's like that. So, we're gonna look at Matthew chapter 12. This is where we're at now, just a few verses down from Matthew 10 that we were just in or a few chapters rather. So Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45 specifically, it would be what Isaiah would call to here. Now these are Jesus' words himself. This is Jesus speaking uh, about unclean spirits. And again, I think this goes into what I said at the very beginning of this podcast, is that there is a um, an understanding within Judaism at this point. Jesus clearly seems to have some of this understanding. I mean, he's the son of God, but he also is obviously working with terms and understandings that the people that he's talking to understand and know. And so there is this understanding going into first century, uh, in the first century of unclean spirits and sort of how they work and sort of things. And there is, uh, and I'm not going to speak to it because I'm not incredibly familiar with it, but there is a lot of discussion amongst the rabbis of the time about how unclean spirits work and what it means to get rid of them and what it there's there's no definitive as far as I can tell within the first century rabbinic tradition of like some hard and fast rule and teaching on unclean spirits. Um, Jesus here though does seem to give some sort of insight on on this. Mute. <laughs> Isaiah specifically <laughs> uses this text as an example again i just want to keep reiterating this as a text that demonstrates that believers can be demonized so this is what jesus says in matthew chapter 12 starting at verse 43 when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person it passes through waterless places seeking rest but finds none then it says i will return to my house from which i came and when it comes it finds the house empty swept and put in order then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself and they enter and dwell there and the last state of the person is worse than the first so also will it be for this for this evil generation now, obviously, the context, there's more context to this. It goes uh, all the way. Actually, I'd say the sign of Jonah maybe is even maybe the beginning of the context in 39. When he's talking about the generation, he's talking about the religious leaders, their signs, them wanting some sort of sign or indication uh, of who he is. So we can talk a little bit about that. I just wanted to very much narrow in on the verses specifically that Isaiah says speak to believers having or being able to be demonized. So, Rob, with that. Where do you want to enter into this? Because there's a lot. I have, I've covered this before because this is also a favorite passage of Greg Locke. This is one of his favorites. Um, so we've covered this before, but what do you have as far as an example of a believer can be demonized based upon this passage? That dude is kind of like the dude perfect rage monster, isn't he? I don't, I don't know much about him, but. Greg Locke? He seems, yeah. I, I don't know anything. Anyway. Sorry. <laughs> you talk about being, I, and I, I say this, and I, I, I could stand corrected, but from what I can tell, he is a really good example of someone being sort of like swayed by winds and waves of doctrine because like he was hardcore fundamental Baptist, and then he went like a little lighter, and now he's like friends with Benny Hinn. And so like the idea that like your, 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 your theology is so ungrounded <laughs> that you can go from one side all the way to the other is, is weird. Not kinda to like mention Mark a lot Dr of other stuff. Yeah, kind of like Driscoll. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, uh, unclean spirits. So, I think, okay, uh, without getting into the details of, like, waterless places and seeking rest and those kinds of things, uh, the like you said, the premise uh, of the argument is unclean spirit cast out uh, returns with seven others. This is, this is possible for the Christian, right? Um, first of all, there is no reason 
to think uh, at all that a person who he may or may not be referring to is a Christian. That isn't stated here. It's not even an assumption here, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Jesus isn't making that case. In fact, that is the way it will be also, or that is the way it will also be with this evil generation. This, That's this the key person, verse right there. That's the key verse. This, yeah. <laughs> this person is, is an illustration. This is an mm-hmm. illustration Jesus is using to describe uh, an evil generation. So even if we're going to take this lit- as a literal person, maybe this actually happened, right? Well, then it's an evil person. <laughs> like uh, that the whole illustration is is uh describing an evil generation what happens to an evil generation can uh, can evil people have lives that look swept and in order of course that happens all the time uh it in fact it happens a lot more often than not mm-hmm. um however uh it, what what isn't mentioned in this little illustration is uh, it, it doesn't say the unclean spirit goes out of a man. It passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds it unoccupied, which means that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God who hovered over the face of the deep uh, is not living there. By definition, that's what that means. So again, this is this is such a stretch that it would probably pull your muscle. So I want to say what I want to say in a minute, but what I do love about this is the farther we've got in, the more rage reacting you're doing. And I love it. It's just, (laughs) so so anyway, so when you take, when you take a poop emoji on the word of God, it's frustrating. Yeah. So again, to what you, again, for the billionth time, I've said it proper exegetical approach is key here. So obviously this last verse, so it will be with this evil generation is key to not only verses 43 and 45, but what's come before, right? So just to belabor the point and make this podcast super long for you guys, I'm just going to read 38 down just so you understand what's going on, right? So you get the full context of what's happening. So it says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them. An evil and adulterous generation. Now, again, evil generation, he's mentioning, seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So he's pulling out a narrative that they know about Jonah and what Jonah did and the sign that Jonah had. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he's making an analogy out of Jonah, what happened to Jonah being correspondent with the Son of Man. And the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they did not repent at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, someone greater than Jonah is here. So he's making a very big point. You're wanting the sign. You're not going to get one except a sign similar to Jonah. And even the people of Nineveh, which, by the way, not Jews. In fact, were really terrible people. The Assyrians were absolutely terrible. Read about some of the things they did to the people they conquered. It's despicable. To repent of. Yeah. <laughs> And so the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment of this generation and condemn it, for they repented at Jonah, but someone greater than Jonah here. And the queen of the south will rise up, right? So we're talking about even somebody, uh, the queen of the south, uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but I believe it's uh, Solomon, the, the queen that came to see Solomon, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the, uh, yeah, there you go, if I just kept reading, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, someone greater than Solomon is here. So he's already said twice, like, there are going to be people that will rise up and condemn you because you want a sign, but a greater sign than anyone else ever got is here, and even in the lesser sign, they repented. Then he goes in to, again, this demonology, which, as I've already stated at the beginning of the podcast, they would have been aware of, uses it as an example for them and says, hey, you have this demonology that you're working with, this understanding of how demons enter and leave people, but so will it be for this generation that even if, uh, oh, sorry, verse 45, then it goes and brings back seven other demons more evil than itself and enter and they dwell there. And the last state of that person, so the person that has been, 
uh, exercise from a demon, but then gets possessed by even worse demons, is worse than the first, also will it be for this evil generation. So this entire thing ties together. He's saying you're looking for a sign, you're an evil generation, people repented at lesser signs than the Son of Man being here before you, and you are going to be just as the demonized man is because you think you're good, but then you get even worse because you haven't repented. And so like this, using this as a proof text, going back to what you said before, right? Uh, you said uh, prescri prescriptive versus descriptive. Yeah. You're using this or they're using this as a text to prescribe something that Jesus is literally using as an example. It's basically the third example. He uses Jonah, the queen of the south demon possession to prove his point. Like you're looking for something when something greater than anything else has ever been here. And you're going to be worse off afterwards because you ignored it. You ignored him. You ignored me. He's basically saying, and so to use this as a proof text for, <laughs> for the Christians can be demonized is to say, I'm going to take these scissors and who was it? Brent Franklin or uh, some, some American, like I'm going to cut out all the divinity passages because I don't like it. <laughs> and so I'm going to come to scripture. I think, I think that was Thomas Jefferson. Thomas I, Jefferson. I don't, I don't remember for sure, but uh, yeah. Anyway, it happened. Right. Somebody did it. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to come to scripture and say, I need this to say what I want it to say about demons. So I'm going to just cut the beginning and after completely off of it and just ignore it entirely. And then slap something on top of it to make it say what I want it to say. Like, it's just, it's yeah. frustrating. Enti like, nothing gets me quite as upset is when you, like, my son is seven and his reading comprehension is not great. But I have a feeling that if I ask him, like, what's going on here, like, he would kind of get it. And I, I, it's just frustrating because I'm just like, I'm not, I mean, I'm sure if I took an IQ Q test, I'm pretty dumb, but like you can read that and see that it's like, this is not what it's saying. Not even close. And like you said, it, there's no even assumption. Not only is there no assumption that this person is a believer, it's not even the point of the example that's being used. That's not even the point. Yeah. It's, it's not the point. And even in the example it says as much as uh, this person is not occupied by the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. or by the Spirit of God. Um, nothing changed about their life. Which kind of goes into the scribes and Pharisees, really. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. This is, this is, um, you, you can only you can only so the the only reason that people follow these guys is because they they don't uh they don't bury in the thing uh they, they don't actually go back and read the whole thing in context um they don't check the verses that are because these these kinds of things are just like puked out really fast and then moved on as if what they just said is fact right uh this happened in the the sermon uh, uh review that you did also of him now I didn't watch the whole thing because I got sick about it, but um, <laughs> that but, tends to happen apparently. The whole, the whole like uh, Jezebel spirit thing, and 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 uh, like it, so the few times that he actually used scripture or quoted scripture in that, it was it was quick. It was just the Bible says, uh, not where, so you can go look at it. And it was uh, like, um, it, it's just, these guys are so irresponsible with God's word. Uh, and this is yeah. just another example of that. Yeah. And I want to, I just want to use, I just want to use this real quick as before we go to the Timothy passage, that just as a, as a, hopefully a teaching, just a teaching second is that, and I feel like I can comfortably say this about Isaiah because I've done way more research on him than I cared to, but I had, I had to <laughs> for the video. Um, <laughs> I genuinely believe, and this is going to make some people mad. So whatever, just you can do whatever you want to do. He seems to genuinely, I mean, be a, fo a follower of Christ. Like I, I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen, seen anything that indicates that he, he was not 
that he's not regenerate. Now, again, I have issues with his conversion story. I, there's a lot of things that I could go into with that. But looking at his life, I have no reason to believe he's not a believer. I do think that this is a really good example of what happens to a lot of people. I would say probably even myself growing up is that you're handed a certain lens and no one tells you to like question it, look at it. No one teaches you how to read the scriptures. And so you just go with it. I mean, he, even Isaiah mentions in, uh, in the, in the video essay, um, that he, he went to his uncle and said, Hey, can we do these verses? Right. And that's a pivotal moment, right? That is a pivotal moment. And so, that. and I make, I make note of that. He, I think even when he reviewed the video himself made note of that. And those are the moments in people's lives of discipleship that will direct how you read things and how you approach things. If you even know what the word exegesis or hermeneutic or any of that is. And if you're not handed tools to do a job properly, you'll try to do the job, but it's not going to, I mean, you can tell me to change brakes, but if you don't give me the right tools to do that, it may or may not get done right. And the car may mm. not ever stop again. And so it's one of those things that like, there are tools that I don't think a lot of people are handed that maybe don't even know exist. And that's not to say that he doesn't understand that hermeneutics and exegesis exist, but he does say and hold to a prophetic preaching um, sort of a way to go about it. And that prophetic mm -hmm. preaching doesn't fit within an exegetical mode. Now he knows how to do it. Because he has an entire playlist in which he'll work through text of scripture verse by verse. So it's not that he doesn't know how to do it. It's that when he preaches, he doesn't feel the need to do it. He doesn't think that's what preaching is for. And that's a whole different conversation. But the point is that with these verses, it's really, really easy to take stuff out of context. And that's where these where Isaiah and people like him rightfully, like, I'm, I'll just admit to you, totally confused. <laughs> like how, how can you know that you're, that you need to go verse by verse, but then take these verses and so butcher them. And so What's that's, wrong with you people? I heard for some, <laughs> RC Sproul, that's Rob guys. He's got a soundboard. I didn't even know that until now. <laughs> and so, um, so that's, that's admittedly, that's where like the confusion really comes for me, where I go, there are a lot of people that I really do believe are believers. I just a hundred percent do not think they should be teachers. Yeah, sure. And, um, I, I, I do not, I think we take far too lightly the verse that says not many of you should be teachers, my brothers, because you will. And I don't think we, we really understand the you will be judged more harshly verse. And if we did, we there'd be a whole lot more people that would shut up <laughs> before well, I think you I, did that. Yeah, two things there. Um, one, <clears throat> what is, was it his uncle that he had that conversation with? Yeah. Is that what he said? His, his uncle? uncle, yeah. Um, so I like this is to your point, to your final point you just made there. Um, uh, his uncle who taught him in, in that moment his uncle bears some of the responsibility for every person that is misguided by this because he was a teacher. <laughs> um, and so that, that, that does weigh something. Right. Um, and secondly, um, uh, when, when uh, Paul is talking about eldership and he talks about uh, new converts, not doing this, not, not taking that role. Um, now, uh, I, I think it it uh, it it tracks right mm -hmm. that what you see in in that uh, essay that you made, um, and again from his from his own mouth and testimony, like the story goes that he uh, comes to Christ, um, and almost immediately uh, oh, he hears yeah, things from God, yeah. and and then he begins teaching and preaching. And, uh, and that's crazy. That shouldn't happen for anyone. Um, you, you need to know what you're talking about first. And I, like, I think that it's actually a kind of an epidemic that, uh, 
that is going on in the church today um, when we have guys who are learning uh, their theology as they're studying to preach. Yeah. I think that's 100%, a problem. A hundred percent. That is made. So that, that doesn't mean you like you learn a text when you're studying to preach that text in a way that you will not learn it any other way. Mm -hmm. So what I'm, what I'm not saying is you're learning as you're studying that um, and seeing things that you hadn't seen before. Of course that, right. But, but if I'm studying this particular text or that particular text to preach it and formulating my belief system for the first time, uh, as I'm getting ready to, that's no, <laughs> no, you, you need to, I, I want the people who are sitting it downstairs in, uh, on Sunday morning who have no teaching role whatsoever to know what they believe and why they believe it from the scriptures. Uh, that, that should be a requirement for just Christians. Yeah. Um, so you, you, <laughs> We have so many guys who are like, well, I don't really know where I'm at with that. And they're studying to preach it next week or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's, um, um, I mean, big you, you have this example within scripture. I mean, there's a reason Paul sets up and says that you're supposed to raise up elders within the church. It's why he's so careful to, um, with Timothy and Titus to set, I mean, this is how, this is why I set you there to do this so that you yeah. know, the church, and even in doing that, Ephesus still falls off the map later. And so it's just, um, this is why within early church history, right, you have schools of theology. You have, they go, the bishops go to the schools of theology to, to really knock some of this out, to learn this and to, to refine that. And this is why I know people like knock seminary all the time, and, but like, you're not going to get a better place to knock ideas off of one another and really refine what you believe and know why until you're challenged on it. Um, to silo yourself off, be like, I just believe this and never be challenged is the dumbest thing in the world. Um, first of all, you don't grow, but, um, yeah, I mean, what did, what did, what did, what did Luther say? Everyone study the Bible on their own and they'll go to hell in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. So we got two verses left. Now we are at sort of a pivot point here. So we're going to go to first Timothy chapter four first. Then we will end the podcast with the what apparently is the knell in the coffin of to prove this for sure. We'll, we have a text in Acts. But before we do that, I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I do want to make a note because um, not that anyone within Isaiah's camp or Isaiah makes this claim himself. But there are people that make the claim, well, all of these texts beforehand were before the Spirit came, right? So... I mean, it's one of the, uh, everything you guys have said, yeah, sure. But when you get into the New Testament, when you get into Timothy and to Acts, the spirits come now. And so then we have these examples of people that, um, you know, now the spirits come, they're, they're indwelt. And you, now there's this, this talk of, you know, unclean spirits. So we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, or yeah, chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 1. And we don't have to go very far because it's basically verse one <laughs> that he indicates is it. But he says, now yeah. the spirit uh, expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to, def to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons uh, through the innocent. Uh, hold on, where am I at? Now the Spirit uh, expressly says that in later times some will depart the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. That's verse one. Then it does, it goes on some other stuff, but that's the verse he says. So he says, "Hey, later times, some being Christians will depart the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Therefore, they are believers that are devoting themselves." to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Therefore, Christians can have or be oppressed or demonized. I really want to be careful because the word technically is demonized by deceitful spirits or teachings of demons. Would be the claim here. You don't believe that? <laughs> well, there will be people that will depart from the faith by devoting themselves. So you have believers that, well, you have people, it doesn't say believers, you have people that leave the faith by believing 
doctrines of devils or teachings of demons, if I'm going to be very specific to the text. Now, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that they're uh, possessed by demons, though. It just means that, again, I think this would go back. If my take on this text is simply it goes back to the same thing we sort of saw, uh, not more with Judas than with Peter, but this idea of them devoting themselves to things, not not to the excess that we talked about with Judas, but to not repenting and then following the teachings of demons instead. But there's no indication to me here that these spirits are indwelt inside of them. No. Um, and the, so the LSB says paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, what what is a doctrine of demon, of a demon, right? That's good thing I mean, to clarify, yeah. Um, uh, you could argue that anything that's not uh, accurate doctrine from the word of God is the doctrine of demons. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's that's true Um, that anything, anything that that isn't derived from um, solid hermeneutic, solid exegesis, solid contextual, like any any doctrinal position that we might take. So let me let me say it this way. I think that um, there is. uh, okay, uh, people believe in infant baptism. Some people do not right? One of them is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of them, one of them is, uh, a, a doctrine that is not from God. So then where's it from? Now that's not going to show up in our, in our, uh, you know, conversations with one another, but we both know that, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and, and we're happy to be corrected one way or the other on the way up. Right. Um, so, so I, I just like, want to clarify because somebody else yeah. is going to probably point this out. So you're saying, so I don't, I I don't, I don't think you hold to, do you hold to infant baptism or no? No. Okay. So are you saying infant baptism is a doctrine of demons? Oh, sorry. Okay. (laughs) Kidding. Um, uh, So I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I guess the short version would be yes. Um, Now, does that mean? that uh, anyone who's been baptized as an infant is under the influence of demons? No. Does that mean that, uh, uh, like, pastors who are Presbyterian are... Uh, I think that's the uh, question here, yeah. The pastors are, are, are demonized? Uh, no, not necessarily. But my point is that uh, doctrines of demons is a, is a, a really broad okay. uh, phrase, right? Uh, so a doctrine of demons or uh, paying attention to deceitful spirits, this idea, I think, um, is, is a really broad thing. It, it, anytime I'm paying attention to, um, to something that isn't scriptural, um, as far as, you know, doctrinally con- uh, concerned, um, it isn't, I mean, if it's not from the scriptures, it's from the, like, there's no middle team, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so that's my point. And, and you're right. I think you hit it on the head when you said that there's no, uh, there's nothing in this verse or the verses after it, uh, uh, that, that would lead anyone to believe that these people, um, so I, I would argue, first of all, that they're, they're not Christians if they fall away from the faith for real, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's where the, yeah, I think that's where the different people are going to watch this and go, well, they have a different, yeah, different necessarily yeah. like a theology behind it. However, even if, even if I um, believed that that could happen, um, even if I believe that Jesus lied in John 10 and said he could <laughs> yeah, lo- lose a sheep, uh, even, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but uh, like, seriously though, even if I believe that could happen, there's no indication here that, that uh, these people, um, Christian or not, are actually uh, uh, demonized in that they have a demon in in them. Yeah, nothing here says that. To to be influenced by demons could be watching a TV show and yeah. being influenced to do, to do something to act out in some way, right? Uh, yeah. it, it doesn't need to be anything more than that here. And I think that so so the first so it does say in later times some will depart the faith. So I think this here may be where is he's getting, if they're departing the faith, that means they were part of the faith. 
And I would say this is probably a like a Demas situation. Uh, in which Demas was, uh, he was like, he was with Paul. He was doing the same things Paul did. I mean, this goes back, this is why I said this is very similar to Judas, in my opinion, is that they're going along, like they're doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, but they then depart the faith, the, the following along, because of the deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. So like you said, you can be the you know, you can have, be led by away by deceitful spirits, by TV shows or something else, because the idea is that if you're not solid in your faith, you may think you're solid in your faith. And then you are led away by these doctrines of demons. I mean, it does go on to say that they're uh, of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food uh, that God created and be received uh, and to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected is to be received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So obviously within the context of what's happening here, there are people that are telling them and this, and to your point about the baptism thing, Paul is telling them that a teaching of demons is that you shouldn't enjoy food or you shouldn't get married. Um, and so he's saying like, there are teachings out here that are not right. And, I think like some of us may, I mean, to the same point of the whole baptism thing that I brought up, somebody see, so people are just because somebody's forbidding marriage, there's a doctrine of demons. Well, this is what Paul is saying is that they're saying they who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods. And he's saying those are doctrines of demons. And so I think to your point, the why definition is an accurate one here. But what he's saying is that they're in the faith, their consciences are seared though. They're basically doing what the Pharisees had done. They're adding on to what God has required. And he's saying there, people are being led away from the faith that way. Now, again, I think the same thing that's happening here that's happened in a lot of other passages, right? We're reading deceitful spirits and teachings or doctrines of demons as those that are in the faith have demons in them. And therefore these demons are leading them away, which goes back to our previous podcast, which takes the responsibility totally off of the person because now mm, it's not yeah. you doing it. It's the demon leading you away from doing it, which isn't what's yeah. being said here. And so while there could be a lot of discussion had on this passage, again, there's no indication whatsoever that these people are believers. And I think this is where we really, a good conversation we may have to have a whole nother podcast about is that just because someone is in the faith, like in the church doing the things they're supposed to do, doesn't mean they are a believer. I mean, this is the whole uh, deconstruction movement, right? Like every deconstructionist I've ever talked to is like, yeah, but I did this. I devoted this time. I did this. I led people in prayer. I was in part of the band. I devoted all my time to it. And I'm like, yeah, great. Demas did too. So did Judas. So did everybody else that eventually left. And so it's not the doing, right? Just because you cast out demons or, or, you know, raise the dead. It's not those things that make you a believer. And just as when, when he's saying here in Timothy, like they left the faith and they were, you know, led away by teachings of demons. It's not that you are demonized or not that you're even a believer when you're doing those things. Rather, like Demas, you are led away by the passions and pleasures of the world, which are teachings of demons. Um, not that you're in pos possessed by one or demonized by one. Okay, I'm going to read something. Awesome. Okay, it's from the Bible. So <gasps> Even awesomer. <laughs> okay, so uh, one of my favorite places in all of the scriptures, because uh, it's encouraging for me, is Romans 7. Uh, and Paul says in verse 15 and following, for what? I am working out, I do not understand, for I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. If I do the very thing I do not want, I agree with the law that is good, that it is good. So now, no longer am I the one working it out, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh, uh, for, the willing, uh, for the willing is present in me, uh, but the working out of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one working it out, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that in me evil is present, in me who wants to do good. 
For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in my members waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Now, where in that bit does Paul? conclude at all that the reason he's doing any of the things that he's talking about has anything to do with demonic influence? He doesn't. Not even once. Good question. (laughs) Paul uh, claims to be the source. His own actions, his own flesh. He doesn't need any help from demons. We don't. We don't need any help from demons uh, to to continue in our sin. Um, so, uh, like the the very notion that uh, it it man it just takes it takes away the gospel to say that um, that you like at at any level that you sin because you're uh, because you have a demon takes away the responsibility. So why did Jesus have to die? Just to free you from that demon? Well, uh, well, that doesn't make any sense. There's no penal substitution necessary if you didn't do it, or if you were coerced or forced to do it by some demonic presence. Um, that's not how that works. <laughs> if, it, if it had something to do, this would be the perfect opportunity right, in the scriptures, if if that were the case, would this not be the perfect opportunity for Paul to at least mention once something about that? And yet crickets. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I think that sums up even what he's telling, well, I mean, obviously Paul is writing both. That's even what he's telling Timothy is that it's like they're just led away by this teaching. It's not that it's this thing that's doing it it's the teaching of this it's the enticement of this idea so i mean the reality to to be clear there is a reality of doctrines of demons there is reality of demonic force that's not what's being discussed here what we're discussing is can a believer be demonized and these are the verses we've been handed (laughs) to prove that Uh, That's the case. And so far, we've got none. Now, we are going to end on Acts chapter 5. So in the video, again, linked in the description, when we get to Acts chapter 5, this is, Ruslan is actually talking to Isaiah, has him on. Isaiah is rattling off all of the verses that we've already talked about. Uh, We've already went through them all. These are the ones that he's mentioned specifically in this video as uh, proof text for why Christians can be demonized. He gets to Acts chapter 5. And Ruslan actually stops him and says, yeah, like this one is like the nail in the coffin. Like when, I mean, Ruslan basically says, hey, when I was listening to it, like, yeah, I guess whatever. But here is like the proof in the pudding. So to be clear, Isaiah doesn't himself necessarily say this is like the nail in the coffin one. But he does agree with Ruslan Ruslan, that, um, yeah, this is a really powerful one. Because again, even to the point, Ruslan points out what I've already said, that this is after the Spirit has come. This is after Pentecost. And so we get to Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4 specifically are what's talked about, but I'll start at 1. And it says, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and uh, and brought only a part of it and laid it before the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie? to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. And while he remained, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have um, contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and a great fear came upon all who heard of it. So this is the general uh, 
again, verses three and four specifically, specifically the verse, the words I emphasized, Satan filled your heart to lie, um, would be sort of the nail in the coffin verse. This proves that even after Pentecost, the believers that are within the church, this is a great example of being filled with the filled with a demon or specifically here, Satan, um, to lie. Are you convinced now? Yep. Oh, in the podcast. Okay, hold on. Let me push the end button. I, <laughs> uh, I need to call Isaiah and get this cast out of me. Um, oh. No. Again, that's not what this means. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, uh, uh, so just as a maybe not even a direct thing, but as a side note, one of the things that you see in this text. Um, so Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? to keep back some of the price of the land. Well, you hear uh, the very uh, verse before that, um, that he kept back some of the price for himself with, uh, with his wife's full knowledge, or that could also be translated with his wife's collusion. Like she was in on it. Like th that's what it means. She was in on it. Um, uh, and then uh, Peter says to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back some of the price of the land? Uh, just, down here, uh, the same thing happens to the wife. Peter responded to her, tell me whether you were paid this much for the land. And she said, yes, that much. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Um, no mention of Satan at all. And yet they are guilty of the exact same thing. Um, uh, uh, so uh, Satan filled your heart. Again, this, this has everything to do with Satan uh, uh, Ananias, um, uh, is in that moment, this is, this is kind of back to the, um, uh, Peter get behind me, Satan thing, right? Yeah. We're it, seeing the theme, odd. aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's odd that Peter is the one speaking here even, right? Mm -hmm. Um, like that, uh, the, the very person who the Lord said, uh, Satan get behind me, who the Lord used this same sort of language uh, to uh, to illustrate something really powerful, uh, is using that same language now with someone else. Um, and uh, notice who gets punished for this. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira uh, are both held responsible for their sin. They're both the ones who have done this thing. It is not blamed on Satan. Uh, they aren't uh, innocent bystanders who were uh, uh, under the power of Satan. Now, this is important. Uh, I just yeah. I just want to interject this real quick yeah. to, to pull out, to show sort of, and I'm sure maybe he or somebody within the camp has a defense for this, but I've heard him say a number of times that just because you're demonized, whenever you die, you'll go to heaven. Obviously, the demons don't because the demons can't. Now, that being said, to tie into the point you were just talking about, right, it's this, there seems to be an inconsistency here, because if, if, if you know, if, if that's in you, if you're being influenced by it, right, if it's, if, if why, why, if, if Satan is the one influencing, is Ananias punished, when, if you are demonized, literally, a Christian is demonized, and you're being influenced by the demons, you still get to go to heaven, but Ananias got killed for, for lying. <laughs> so there just seems to be an inconsistency or an application if we're using this verse as a proof. To, I just want to bring that in real yeah. quick. So yeah. Keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fine. I, I mean that I've, I've kind of made the point, I think at least the point I was attempting to make like this is this when, when uh, Peter says to him, um, so would you say Ananias is a believer? I guess is the key point here. Uh, so I I would say um, I would say it doesn't matter, okay? Um, uh, because Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit doesn't mean necessarily that Satan had mm. that Satan was in him. Good point. Right. Uh, the, the lie is what. Uh, the the influence, if there is influence there, right? I think what Peter was getting at here is the same thing Jesus was getting at 
when he said, Peter, get to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He wasn't talking to Satan. He was talking to Peter and he was saying, Peter, you're on the wrong team right now. Right? Um, so and do I believe Ananias and Sapphira were Christians or not? I'm I'm not sure. Uh, probably not. Um, uh, but uh, but I don't think that that's what this is saying here anyway. Yeah, I don't think this is saying that uh, that Satan was in him uh, mm -hmm. or her. Um, generally, Satan doesn't have to do a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> as you've already yeah, as you've already yeah you've already stated yeah yeah. No, I, and I think that's a good point. I mean, because we've talked about this entire time as far as looking at it exegetically for what it's trying to say. And the point isn't whether or not he was a Christian or not, but it's what he did when he was, um, where's the word? So the fact that Satan filled his heart uh, to lie seems to indicate that to lie to the Holy Spirit is that maybe he didn't have the Holy Spirit to begin with. I mean, we have, we have examples of this, right, with... Um, Oh gosh, who is the magician that later happens in Acts where he sees what's happening and he gets baptized too, but it never says he has the spirit. Um, even though like, Simon? Uh, yeah, Simon the magician. And so what we have over and over again in Acts, right? Luke seems to be very careful to talk about who's baptized versus who receives the spirit and the order isn't ever the same. And so there are definitely people that are in the church that have been baptized into the church in Acts that don't have the spirit. Uh, and then there are other people that do have the spirit and then get baptized. But like you said, for the, for the, for the purposes of the discussion we're having about believers being demonized, um, it doesn't here seem to indicate that it matters because again, Satan's not in him. Satan is filling his heart, not with himself, but with the, the desire to lie to the Holy Spirit and to the apostles. So it's not even a matter of um, if he's demonized because that's not what the text is trying to talk about. The text is trying to right. specifically talk about what led him to the point in which he drops dead in front of Peter, uh, which I think is a good call out, again, exegetically. Um, so the nail in the coffin text here that indicates that, look, believers can have demons <laughs> fall short because there's no indication that Ananias yeah. has a demon. Rather, he is at... At best, I will say, influenced by Satan to lie for his own personal gain seems to be the gist of what is happening here. He wants to appear, yeah. as we've seen within the gospel text that we've read, he wants to appear pious because everyone's bringing something before the apostles. He wants to appear the same way. He knows that he can get away with doing half of it because no one knows how much the property is, only his wife. So she's in on it with him too because she's the only other one that would know. They appear bring before appear to be pious are not actually, but rather whitewashed tombs <laughs> come before <laughs> and in so doing. And this is actually, again, this is where I said before, we can just read over something and be like, Oh man, that's really powerful. But when we get deeper, we see there's actually deeper meaning here because when Peter says to him, you're not just lying to us, like you're lying to the Holy spirit. So it's not, his actions aren't just against another man it is against a holy god because of the action yep. that he claims to be doing so the deeper meaning here is actually far more powerful and applicable even at the end of verse five seems to be the point and a great fear came upon all who heard about it like <laughs> you heard ananias lied right <laughs> like you probably don't want to yeah. do that <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting it's interesting here that peter doesn't um come alongside this Christian and cast this demon out here. Yeah. Right. Um, so apparently this isn't prescriptive. All yeah. of a sudden. Well, let's end with that. I don't have anything else to say about acts. Do you have anything else to say about this passage? Uh, not about this particular passage, but just about the whole, the whole thing that we've been talking about in yeah. general. I just have one more thing. Got it. Yeah, me too. Give us some men who it. know the truth. <laughs> That's Steve Lawson right there. Uh, like buttons. Yeah, I'm glad that you uh, you learned the uh, the soundboard thing. That's nice. I'm glad you got it. I, I'm surprised that it's even coming through to where I can hear it. I just love that because I can't get mine to do that. 
So there's that. Yeah, well. well, so to end this, here, here's what I would say with this, right? Is that I think there, there is a discussion to be had about um, demonized demonology, demons, evil spirits, unclean spirits. Mm-hmm. Right? There is a discussion to be had about that. The discussion we, we've been having over the total of this podcast, which is like two and a half hours nearly, is that um, is there text that demonstrate that believers can be? And I wanted to be very careful not to just cherry pick, oh, well, this is the, this is, these are the texts specifically that he gave. And so there you go. And the argument seems to be, and I think would still probably be, well, you say there's no definitive text of Christians being demonized in scripture, but there's no definitive text of them not being demonized in scripture. I've heard that a few times, just so you know, that is a, that is a comeback, quote unquote. And so... To that, I'll say this, and then I'll let you answer, and we'll end the episode. An argument from silence is a really bad argument, first off. Secondly, if you're going to claim that something is an actual thing and hold enormous services, deliverance ministry services, to cast demons out of Christians specifically and say it is the children's bread to do so, and use verses from the Bible to say, this definitely proves it. But when they are proved wrong, then say, well, yeah, but you don't have any verses to say it doesn't happen. It seems like a really big cop-out to me. (laughs) It Um, just sort of proves that, to me, that we're just handling this, like, you're just handling these verses so dishonestly that I don't know how you can do so with a good conscience. That's my end. I think it proves the point. I think if that's the response, then I think um, they've made your point for you. Because if if there was a legitimate rebuttal to the exegesis, or and I mean what we've done has is not is not necessarily it's like a surface thorough. Level. No, it is a hundred percent surface right, level. Right. So, but so if if the things that we've said, if you could come back with with something exegetical and say, well, but this Greek word or that thing or whatever, right? If you could come back and do that, then wouldn't you? Like, wouldn't wouldn't you come back with a, an actual substantive rebuttal instead of saying, um, well? You can't, you know, you know what I mean? That, that doesn't make any sense. It's like, you know, yeah, the Bible doesn't say anything about unicorns existing or not either. Um, so I guess you can believe in unicorns if you want, right? Like there are probably a few winged Pegasus flying up right now up above the church here. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to head out and take a look and get my binos, you know, yeah, you uh, can't prove because the Bible doesn't say, like, come on, that's, a, that's such a stupid argument. <laughs> Tis the argument, though. So, anyway, that being said, guys, if, if if you, I'm sure you have some opinion on this. If you do, make sure you leave a comment below. I I I I feel like we handled these texts again very surface level, but very straightforward and honestly. If you don't think so, if you think maybe uh, we did it, leave what verse it was down below as well, and I'd love to again address that if possible. And uh, hopefully, at, at the end of the day, hopefully this was helpful to you. And you benefited from it. And at least it got you thinking about how you approach the text and why you approach it the way you do. That, if nothing else, hopefully that came through. And also, before we end here, you need to head over to the Bearded Bible Thinker and subscribe and check him out. And if you like him, let him know. All right? All right. What do you got, Rob? And, and if you don't, then don't let me know. Yeah, don't let me know. It's like it was... <laughs> my, my, my self-esteem can only take so much. Yeah, yeah. Because I get all of my self-worth from what people think about me. That's so. what I do. Apparently that's what yeah. I do. That's why I post on Instagram because I like the likes. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, no, I don't care at all about what you think. Um, so, um, come over and say hi. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't really have anything else. Uh, okay. I think, I, I think I would just say like, quite honestly, and, and again, this isn't meant necessarily as like a, like backstab or anything like that. Um, but just just based on uh, these verses being the ones that that are used, 
just based on the brief bit of uh, looking at them honestly that we've done and um, just based on the the fact that uh, that they've been misused so obviously um, I just you know what learn what not to do from these guys if you're gonna if you're gonna partake if you're gonna look listen to their things um, r- write down how not to do ministry or how not to exegete scripture yeah, because yeah. that's really what's on that's really what's demonstrated you know um, this is how not to study your Bible. Yeah. Um, they're, they're not good people to follow. Yeah. If, if to learn from, let me say it that yeah, way. I do have. Yep. Yeah. I will add to that and then we'll end. I, again, as I've said before earlier, I, I have no reason to believe that Isaiah specifically isn't a believer, but that does sure. not mean I don't have issue severely with the things that he teaches. Um, Yeah, I think there's a huge difference between someone still being a believer while also teaching things they should not teach. Um, Yeah, Mm -hmm. I don't know where that line stops, but there's definitely a line there. But anyway, all right, guys, if you like it, make sure you share. If you comment, make sure they're nice. And we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.